I've been doing my explorations around the world since now 25 years. I've been to um, 169 countries. I was in Kazakhstan yesterday, going back to Himalaya on Sunday. So I'm traveling almost every day around the world. Uh, my ex-girlfriend did a calculation. I spent 3,000 nights in a tent. That's eight and a half years of my life in a tent. So no, I'm not married. Uh, <laughs> so what is exploration? Well, exploration is not a geographical journey. It's an inner discovery of your own true potentials. Every time you break a pattern, every time you go outside your comfort zone, it's a part of evolution. It's a part of that adventure within yourself to dare something, to do something, to see beyond. For generations and thousands of years, people have been doing that the whole time. But in school, when I grew up, people said that it's not possible, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then one day, I decided to become a piano player. So I took three years of my life, between 15 and 18, to become a concert piano player. And three years later, I was, I was working at a Grand Hotel in Stockholm. And my friend said, well, you happen to have an ear for music, but you can't just put this in a different context. I mean, you can't just do whatever you want to in life just with motivation and focusing. Well, that's exactly what I can, I said. Well, you were the worst in the football team. You can't just grab a bicycle and go to Germany from Stockholm just because you want to. Listen, I can go to the Sahara next week, but I don't want to. Oh, excuses. Fine. So the next week, I quit my job. I got a bicycle. I got a tent. Started biking to the Sahara. Uh, first day I threw up was the worst thing I'd done in my entire life. I called my mom and said, I'm coming home. She said, well, you did today, right? Maybe you can just try tomorrow. I tried tomorrow, called my mom, I'm coming home. Well, you did yesterday, you did today, maybe you can do tomorrow again. What's interesting is that if you only do today for 52 days, you get to the Sahara. <laughs> so when people say that, did you bike to the Sahara? No, I did just every day for 52 days and I just ended up there. So by doing that, I started to explore the, you know, the planet a lot. You know, living with cannibal tribes in Papua New Guinea. I'm having a friend for dinner. It got a new meaning. Um, climbing the highest peaks of the world, 8,000 meters without oxygen in Himalaya. Did my first film about climate change in 97, uh, spending 100 days in uh, minus 50 down in Antarctica. Um, all these expeditions, if it's rock climbing, 4,800 meters in uh, um, in Indonesia or, you know, climbing the highest mountain of Antarctica. All these things have been a journey over the time that people say that it's not possible. They say you cannot go in Stockholm and kayak from Stockholm to Africa. It will take forever. No, six months. <laughs> but you have to do it 12 hours per day. And I was, so, I was so annoyed because this one, it was going like, you know, against the stream the whole time, especially through like, you know, Holland and Netherlands, these kind of countries where the, you know, the tide was going the wrong way. So I thought like, what if this could fly? So I went home again and I took a rubber dinghy, put a Skido engine on it, a propeller and a wing, and I created a flying boat. Uh, <laughs> inventions, you know, nothing is impossible. The impossible just takes more time. So, so I had some interesting conversation at 2,000 meters, 6,000 feet. Um, you would like to enter Barcelona airspace in what kind of aircraft? Rubber boat, you know, trying to steer this thing. Um, the adventures over the time, you know, even if it's been like, you know, walking across Alaska or all these kind of expeditions have been a little bit crazy sometimes because I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, especially jet ski over the Atlantic. Um, but these trips, these trips slowly started to put me in a situation where I thought that things was possible. All those teachers in schools, I'm just giving them one finger, I can say that, because things are possible if you believe in that. If you believe over and over again that you can do it. So I tried to push myself outside my comfort zone the whole time. And I wanted to do something after I climbed Mount Everest that was absolutely the major expedition of my life going from the North Pole to the South Pole without engine. So that would take me 525 days, 18 months of traveling, staying in a tent. Uh, sailboats, tents, skiing, bicycling. And I can assure you, uh, this sled was 130 kilos. Only North Pole was around 60 days in minus 50. You remember in school or at work, you wake up in the morning, it's raining outside, it's very cold. You, you call your boss and say, listen, I think I'm sick today, I'm gonna stay home. I cannot really do that here, because if I'm doing that, I lose food for the next day, and I have one more day until I get to land. So I created something called NOX, stands for no excuses. If you want to reach something in life, you want to reach your goal in life, there are no excuses. Get up, 
do your work, move forward. So during this trip across the planet, I was also had to do 1,700 kilometers of kite surfing across Greenland uh, to be able to get to the other side. All these things have one thing in common. Everybody said, this is not possible, you cannot do this. But how come I did it then? Because I didn't give up. All these people are showing this invisible wall, saying that you cannot do this, you cannot do that. My whole life people have been saying that. And then I come back and say, well, you happen to be good at this. No, no, it's not about that. It's about the mindset. It's about do not ever give up. So I created a philosophy called the wall philosophy, where I would ask you know, people saying that, so can I walk through a brick wall? People would say, of course, it's impossible. You're made of flesh and bone. So I would ask you, can I walk through a brick wall? And somebody might say, you know, of course, you cannot do that. And I would say, I don't know how to do it. But just because I don't know how to do it doesn't mean it's impossible. If I would show my iPhone in the 13th century, they'd probably burn me alive. If I show electricity in the Stone Age, they think that I'm God. Maybe in 10,000 years, we can walk through a brick wall. I have people playing football live on my iPad in Australia right now. I have no idea how that works. It doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means that we don't know how it works yet. So just because I don't know how it works doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that I haven't found out how it works yet. So when I was giving the lowest grade in gymnastics in school, do you think that I thought that I would do the Adventure Grand Slam as a sixth person in history, doing all the seven summits, the North Pole and the South Pole? No, because people told me that I couldn't do those things. I was listening to people the whole time saying that you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, that's up to me what I can do, right? Nobody can tell me what I can do because that's up to me. But I must assure you that climbing Mount Everest was to push my limits to the absolutely furthest. To start the expedition, it's like one and a half year before. Training, 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 eating, eating, training over and over again, trying to foresee everything because this was my big dream. Then I started to think about the difference between goals and dreams. A goal, when I was doing research around the planet, asking people in many countries, a goal is something you know you will reach. You have your comfort zone, within that comfort zone you have a goal, something you know you can do. You can walk from here to the Statue of Liberty, that's a goal. You can walk around the planet, that's a dream. And when I ask people, people say that dreams are for other people. Oh, I would love to do that. He's such an amazing person. Those are dreams. Goals, that's for me. But I have something to tell you, you can do the dreams. It's just that you have to take it step by step, as my mother said, you know? If you do that slowly, you will go outside your comfort zone and into those dreams. Because I can assure you, when I'm walking across these ladders, 300 ladders, I'm not a very tough guy, I can assure you. I'm very nervous and I'm very scared because I believe that if you do these things, you overwin your fears. It's a little bit too loud, I think. <laughs> 300 times I walked over these ladders, and 300 times I was nervous, I was scared, but I knew it would be possible because I've trained for it. Research, asking other people. When I climbed my first mountain in Himalaya, uh, I asked people all over the world, what mistakes have you done? And that became my greatest knowledge while climbing Mount Everest. I didn't know what to do, but I knew what not to do. So over and over again, you know, I'm fighting with these things, people saying that you cannot do this, you cannot do that. But when you go through these moments of, you know, you don't have any faith anymore. You don't, I mean, this glass that is normally half full is very half empty. Many times. And one time when I was climbing Mount Everest, I was at 8,500 meters and I want to turn around. I don't think there's a chance in a million, maybe one chance in a million to reach the summit and back again alive. But then I came to think of a film that I saw a few years ago. And I started to laugh. Can you imagine me at 8,600 meters with frostbites and this and that, standing there laughing with his down suit? I thought about this film. I'm going to share this short clip with you because this kept me going. One chance out of a million. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. Straight out, flat out, I want you to give me an honest answer. What do you think the chances are of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together. What are my chances? Not good. You mean not good like 
one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Happy! He was, yeah. yeah, come on guys, he was so happy because it's one chance out of a million. It was not zero. So climbing up Mount Everest, I'm thinking about Jim Carrey laughing my ass off, thinking about, wait a minute, there's one chance out of a million. I'm going to take that one chance. So going up the last part, this is the deadliest place on the planet, the, the, the Kumb Icefall. And going up there and knowing that these 300 ladders over and over again, climbing up and down, climbing up and down, I knew there is a chance. I knew there's a risk, but I've been planning for this risk. So when I do these climbs, for example, up 8,600 meters, I'm also walking slowly, 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 and I'm thinking about like, you know, come on, I can make this, I can do this. But if I sit down, I will probably die. And I've been thinking about this word the whole time, Mount Everest, Mount Everest. But if I sit down, I die, Mount Everest, it's spelled the wrong way. So I renamed the mountain to Mount Neverest. Uh, that was one way for me to continue the whole time up the Hillary step and up to the summit of planet Earth. And I must say, there is a kind of mixed feeling standing on the summit. Because when you stand there, you know you have halfway down. You're only done halfway. So when I did that, when I came up there, I promised some kids in a hospital who had cancer, I'm going to bring their toys up to the summit of the world, I'm going to bring them back to the beds again. So I did that, and that was the beginning of a long journey of philanthropy that I've been doing now for, for many, many years. For example, when I came down from the mountain, I saw there was so much garbage on the mountain. It was the worst, biggest pile of garbage. So I put together a team. Uh, we were 200 people working for three years to take down 15 tons of garbage from Mount Everest. Uh, so what do you do with 15 tons of garbage? Well, first of all, um, it's one million uh, pet bottles, one million plastic bottles. So we give this artists from all over the world, and we're recycling Everest and creating art and, re and selling the art, and the money goes back to build up um, the Kumbo Valley after the earthquakes. Um, a few years later, I come back to climb to 8,000 meters unclimbed peaks, and it was a big earthquake, as you remember, a few years ago. So I stayed there for four months, starting a project called Never Ending Peace and Love, where we actually started to work to build up the villages after the earthquake. So I stayed there for four months. I've been working now for two years, uh, raising millions of dollars, and going back now, that's why I'm going back on Sunday again, to see if these projects you know, work. We're doing fundraising and doing crowdfunding, everything, to be able to do these things. I've been working for 25 years uh, documenting glaciers from all over the world because I believe that, as we've been saying before, climate change is a major issue. And I'm, I'm not a politician. I cannot change the, you know, the, the laws. I'm not a scientist. I cannot prove the figures, but I'm a window. I go to places where nobody else goes. I go to areas where nobody else dares to go, but I can bring the facts back to the politicians. So scientists are using me when I go around the planet to be able to do these things. I took 17 kids with cancer, for example, from also from hospitals up to the Arctic to show them something, uh, you know, really to see something extra in life. Then one boy called me up and said, listen, Johan, uh, can you coach me? I said, yeah, what's the story? Well, I'm in a wheelchair, you know, and I got cancer from the spine and down. I cannot, you know, walk. So can you coach me? Yes. Uh, where do we meet? And I sent him the name. That's the summit of Sweden, he said. I'm in a wheelchair, but that's not my problem, is it? I'm going to start on that summit. If you want to join me, I will be there. But how am I going to get up? Well, you can crawl, right? So I made him crawl for one week. And he was bleeding there, sitting there crying on the summit after one week. He said, Johan, I'm up now at 2,000 meters. Can we start the coaching? I said, that was the coaching. Um, working with these philanthropy projects, flying doctors uh, from LA down to uh, South America with Operation Smile. I also started a project called Not to Walk in a Park, where we did the world's first and only walk through Serengeti National Park. And we walked for almost two months, and I brought AK-47 uh, rangers with me to take down uh, traps and, and, and arrest uh, teams. So we were actually working with this for, um, for a few months, and um, 
So these kind of projects is something that I really, you know, enjoy of doing. Um, I did another project called, um, uh, it was the highest concert in the world. I brought a reggae band from San Diego up to the summit of Kilimanjaro, and we made a song uh, called The Other Side of the Mountain, which was uh, actually on this summit. And we wrote a song, um, and all the money from iTunes went back again to raise money to save elephants and rhinos. Um, so we had 7 million viewers uh, in media all over the world, and we raised around uh, 1 million euro for, uh, for this kind of project. I did one thing a few months ago. We were driving across Africa from north to south. We brought four uh, doctors with us with 5,000 eyeglasses to give kids an opportunity to read in schools through Africa. Uh, I'm also ambassador for uh, the UN project, um, Nonviolence Project. And I hand-painted this one and brought it up to 6,000 meters and placed it in Himalaya on one of the summits for world peace. Um, I'm working a lot with AIDS research. I'm on the fundraiser board of AMFAR, and I work with Prince Albert Foundation and some others, but I auction out my trips around the world at different galas. So I'm raising between three and five million dollars per year uh, at different galas around the world. Uh, this is actually me last week, uh, whale shark uh, diving in Mexico. <laughs> no, two weeks ago, actually. Um, so I do all these kind of projects, you know, helping rhinos, helping lions, and these kind of projects, because I believe that nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something, you know? And for me, for example, working with animals is such an important thing, because um, I saw the Snow Leopard Foundation um, a few weeks ago in Kazakhstan, that's when we keep going back there, and we have, now we have uh, 500,000 square meters of wide land to put, um, to protect the, the, the snow leopards. So all these kind of projects together is something that's becoming, becoming like an adventure activism for me. Because when I grew up, I saw this iceberg, and I realize now how it has changed, how the, the whole view of the iceberg, you can do so much more than you can even think about, you know? Because I have this saying the whole time that I've been saying a few times that everything is possible, the impossible just takes more time. And for example, now, for example, I have two, three more projects that I work on, I'm uh, just going to say this uh, finally. One is, uh, I do a lot of online lectures, for example, and I just contacted some schools in Sweden, and we had 9,000 students in 88 schools at the same time, connecting. So now we're doing a project uh, within one year where we're going to actually connect one million students from all over the world in one lecture about not, you know, losing faith that you can do the impossible possible. Another project that I'm working on right now um, with Andrea Bocelli Foundation, that is pretty interesting actually, is that I, a boy from London contacted me, he said, I love your lectures, but I'm blind. I cannot experience the flowers you're explaining in Amazon Jungle. So I'm bringing a group of blind kids to Amazon Jungle with a poet from London. And we are creating a book where you have on one side my photography, and on the other side, you have the blind scripture of, of the poems. And then we have QR codes, so you can listen to the sound of the jungle if you click on it. So, so, so it's an interactive photo book for, for, for blind kids. So I can show them what I'm seeing around the world. Because if you just add a little name like impossible, just add a dot, pang, I'm possible. It's so easy. Have a nice day. Thanks for listening.